Handsome, Logan. Hey guys, and welcome to another Cassid game here on Follow Grubby. We're gonna be watching the Muslim against the Viper on the map High View. The Muslim is gonna be playing as Holy Roman Empire, and his opponent, the Viper, is going to be playing as the Chinese. As is customary for my casts, I tend to watch the replay from a single point of view, so as to not spoil what the player that we're watching may not know about their opponent. In many casts, they watch at both points of view, and while that is interesting and it's the standard meta, you tend to lose out on information that puts you within the perspective of the player that you're watching. Seeing everything, it is hard for us to, well, to close our mind to what we see on the map with the Fog of War revealed. And I'm aiming to bring a different experience which also happens to be a great way to learn the game. Oftentimes, when I've been learning in RTS, I tend to watch a replay twice, once from each point of view, so that I can see the story from either side. If you ever have a game that you think is interesting to watch, that I've casted, you can always ask me to watch it from the other point of view as well, so that we can see how the game was for them. I would reserve this for particularly good games. All right, now that we are beginning, let's talk about the opener. The Muslim has gone for a um, prelate right away, which is always a good investment with Holy Roman Empire, as they 1.4 times increase your gathering rate. Doesn't increase your villager walking speed, so a prelate doesn't exactly multiply your villager count times 1.4, but uh, the gathering rate is that much faster. So he's just kind of eyeballing how to make his villagers all inspired. He will inspire these five, send it back, inspire all his food villagers. And kind of eyeballing how he needs to get his 400 food and 200 gold together. Typically, Holy Roman Empire can get their Aachen Chapel started at around the 2 minutes and 30 second mark. There's variations where you go 4-2 split or 6-0 and slowly you'll adapt. And experienced players can pretty much just change up the order a bit. There may be one ideal order of how to do things uh, in terms of villager distribution between gold and food, but this one is uh, solid. So he starts his Aachen Chapel with uh, three villagers. Generally, you just want to touch the tip of your gold villagers with the circle of the Aachen Chapel. So it covers more gold area than required right now, as the villagers will always only be here. Additionally, the lumber camp tends to just block the corner of the Aachen Chapel. So had the lumber camp been here, then the Aachen Chapel could have been here, roughly, let's say here, and it would cover more of the wood, inspiring the future wood villagers by more. However, he does have the option to have inspired stone villagers, and that is a pretty nice advantage. Finally, you want to make sure to also cover your early game food. This can be achieved either by having Aachen Chapel cover your town center, as it does now, or to build an additional mill and pull up your resources around that. Sometimes you also start with a deer camp around your town center, and you can try to include that as part of the to be inspired area. You can now see that the prelate has gotten bugged. This will probably be fixed in the future, but this happens when a prelate is pulled away from inspiring a villager. As he's about to inspire it, he is pulled away. That villager remains obsessed in his mind, and it could be this this villager, or this one, or this one, or this one. He hasn't noticed it. Now he's going to do manual inspiration uh, on his uh, gold villager, and then try to seek the original autocasted villager. Once the prelate finds them, and I can now say it's none of these, it must be one of his food villager, he will resume autocasting. So if you ever have that bug, now you know how to fix it. Place it next to your wood, see if he autocasts, then move him to your food, see if he autocasts. So right now we can say that the Muslim has been playing with a handicap. This doesn't happen to me anymore because I now understand why it happens. But as a new player, it can be very confusing. Luckily, the Aachen... Uh, that's the one. That was the one. It was this villager. See? He's auto-casting again. So it was always this, this little lady here, this little miss. But now that Aachen Chapel is finished, everything is fixed. 
He goes inside the chapel and casts his inspirational radius in the circle here. We have a massive stable power build. We also have the immediate starting of professional scout technology. This stable is being built in under 10 seconds and he will immediately start scout production. Getting extra scouts up will allow the Muslim to carry back deer carcasses to the vicinity of his town center. He can either drop them here at his TC or here at the mill. It's quite immaterial which one he chooses, either way they get inspired. Now I'm gonna tell you the expectation for how Holy Roman tends to play out the game here. Holy Roman has a pretty difficult matchup into factions like Rus that tend to snipe relics away with their mounted monks and against Mongols, which tend to tower rush their woodline, denying their economy. But against other Holy Roman Empire players, they tend to win 50% of the time. Against Abbasi, Delhi and Chinese, which tend to be a bit more of a slow starter, Holy Roman is doing quite well as well. And Chinese is one of their best matchups, because Chinese tend to play passively early on, economically, giving Holy Roman the chance to do the ideal fast castle build. If you're interested in Ideal Fast Castle, you can check out my video on it. It's on my YouTube. It's called Ultimate Holy Roman Empire Guide Part 1. In that one, I make some outposts to defend key locations. You can also do it with this professional scout technology, securing meat for a long time to come. Professional scouts technology should be well understood here. You're making it safer and bringing deer to your town center rather than having to send your villagers there to harvest the deer on location. You're less harassable now. Additionally, because you're bringing back so many deer, including perhaps even your opponent's deer, you're securing your food under the Aachen Chapel. Inspired deer harvest with the speed of deep water fish boats, which is an incredible speed of gathering. Note though that the Muslim put his deer too close together to one another giving no space to the villagers to harvest. Some of his villagers are waiting, so while it says he's got 19 villagers mining, there's at least six that aren't working at any one time. Because of this, it is better to actually... Hold on one sec, sorry. Thank you so much for the sub. I'll just mute it for a bit and replay it later. Because of this, it's better to, to throw the deer in various different places. The ideal case scenario is one here under the TC, one here, one here, one here, one here. But deer scout retrieval is already tedious enough. A lot of, it's cumbersome multitasking. So if you just drop them all here in the open, that's probably better than some villagers not working. He's bringing back more and more carcasses as possible while also using a few spears that don't have the brace mechanic, by the way, into horses to try and help his scouts beat the Chinese scouts. Just making a couple of spears. This actually delays his castle timing. There's one more thing to note about deer. Deer do not make your castle faster. You can castle as early as 7 minutes and a bit under ideal circumstances. 7.30 under less ideal circumstances. Professional scouts either has you tech to castle at the same time or even slower. But what it does do is it adds a lot more value once you actually get there. Okay, now how many prelates does the Muslim have right now? He's got one in the chapel and a new one made. But notice how fast castle tech is coming up. This is actually only leaving time for a single prelate production. He could have started prelate production a little bit earlier. I try to keep as a rule of thumb to start my extra prelates 10 seconds before I even start my castle timing, provided it doesn't delay my castle timing. AKA, I already have 700 gold, but I don't have 1200 food yet. I've also been wondering whether it is wise to maybe, instead of one to three villagers on wood, which tends to be fairly common for perfectionists that are trying to get fast castle, instead trying to have like four villagers on wood, constantly, consistently. The advantage of that, as the prelate gets attacked and starts a conversion, and he will actually steal the horses! Two horses stolen, nice. One scout and one horseman has been stolen. Forestry upgrade has completed as well, apparently. And uh, no mill. Oh, he has a wheelbarrow upgrade as well. That's actually part of the reason he was delayed to castle as well, why he only started it at 8.30. But I tend to try and uh, uh, yeah, start some prelates before I open castle. Then you can have three prelates ready to retrieve relics immediately. 
And while against Chinese it may not be as important to have three, four prelates ready on the map, uh, it tends to be more important into Rus or Mongols that tend to pressure your prelates out in the wild. What I do like is the small cordon of spears that can help a little bit. Otherwise your prelates are doing wishful thinking. It's how I still retrieve a lot of my relics. The Muslim is the rank 1 player right now, and Viper is the most successful Age of Empires player of all time uh, in, in, in various Age of Empires games. So this is... If you have any doubt at all, we can assume that the way it's being played here is one of the most optimal as we understand them at the time. Critical thinking is good, and there may be better ways to do some of the things. But it is a sa safer assumption to assume that some of these moves are correct rather than that they are incorrect. We have a blacksmith ready with ranged armor coming up. We also have the veteran men at arms upgrade complete. Having a single barracks out to be able to make that upgrade and have those small few spears, not even upgrading them to hardened spearmen, has achieved a pretty cool thing. Normally, I tend to throw up four barracks at the same time once I've got the wood for it, and then I start all the upgrades and then men at arms. But having one barracks complete one upgrade, in addition to the spears, is a pretty cool way of doing things. We have four relics already because the Chinese player, Viper, didn't really contest any of them. This is why Holy Roman is such a powerhouse into them. We have a three relic max, now come in those three extra barracks, and we see the most standard way to play the game as Holy Roman Empire. This has actually been bothering me a bit, going for Mass Men at Arms as my standard tactic. Being so predictable, and this game being a counter game, a game of counters, of hard counters in fact, I've run a mock of many counter strategies that uh, deal with men at arms. Um, the most obvious one being mass crossbows, and then maybe some mangonels. Crossbows with a defensive position, and that's exactly what we're seeing coming out here from Viper. The scouts of the Muslim have seen that, he's keeping one scout with his small little spearman army, while well, the remaining scouts are still bringing back ever more deer carcasses for a secured meat supply. It should be noted that the Muslim started his palace of Swabia with 7 villagers at no later than 11 minutes and 30 seconds. An insanely fast imperial timing that is probably destined to outboom anything the Chinese could have been cooking up until this point. The Viper may well be, having mined, by the way, 250 stone by now, so he can either have a few stone outposts or be on his way to another expansion, another town center. Actually, how did he afford the town center, the second one, with just 250 stone? Did he marketplace trade for it? Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly, but either way, Imperial has been reached. And let's see how the Muslim is using it. And let's take stock of the upgrades he has so far. I also like the speed with which he's starting farming upgrades. He has still been bringing back deer carcasses. And if you press Ctrl Shift A, you can see, okay, he's got one herdable sheep. Apparently it does not counter the carcasses because those are essentially neutral, apparently. Um, when I play in the game, I can actually see how many things I have. But yeah, not right now. So we have um, two ranged armor upgrades for men at arms. We have an army of three prelates, four spears, five scouts that belong to him. And note how there's one scout that belongs to, that used to belong to the Viper. That's why they are not grouped together. This is after all a Chinese scout. Funnily enough, I cannot control left click it to locate it. So they are seen as the same unit when I control left click but not in the grouping together of numbers. So interesting little thing. More houses are coming out. Palace of Swabia is spamming villagers, of course. Lots of farmland coming out. We also have the horticulture upgrade coming out, which helps for food gathering of farms, even if not for deer carcasses or, or, um, or sheep, I believe. It may help on sheep, actually. Not 100% about that. Lots of gold right now. He's still farming gold with seven villagers with the Aachen Chapel uh, buff as well. Not able to use it that much yet. And what did he just spend it on? Oh, there we go. Blue Marie melee attack, third ranged armor. We're getting marching drills out all from the same blacksmith. 
And then we're also getting elite Landsknechte and elite men at arms. There we go. Gold has been spent indeed. The monks are AFK. They could have, in theory, taken the sacred sites. Not entirely without risk, but it might have been a good way to use them. On the other hand, though, they are casting inspiration on all the villagers, which are outside of the range of the Aachen Chapel. And this means that he's gathering wood at a greater rate. At this moment, he doesn't actually need more gold. Sacred sites are, of course, a bonus. He doesn't need more gold at the moment, so I'll even go and venture that this was more useful as the extra wood allows him to expand his current wood uh, gathering rate and that allows him to expand his infrastructure. The Muslim is very low on army. He's got three Landsknecht. He's got all his barracks rallied to the back of his base to hide his units and he's trying to spam out as many men at arms in Landsknechte as possible. Note how the, the men at arms look like a three star unit like veteran instead of a elite because he made them before that upgrade finished. Even so, they will still come out as an elite. An attack comes in here of crossbows, 13 Choganu and 11 crossbows, three rams. And I think Viper is doing the right thing, going immediately for the Reknitz Cathedral. Three relics for Holy Roman Empire gives a gold generation of 900 per minute. This is a tooltip error. That is equivalent to 22 and a half uninspired villagers working on gold with uh, minimum upgrades. So it's like 20 extra villagers. Instead of 82 economy, he's got over 100. Killing this instantly drops that gold income and it is a valuable takedown. University is here and he's working on elite army tactics, bonus damage and health of melee. The Muslim is coming in with an attack. He's got just eight men at arms, five Landskrift and two prelates that are coming as well. I think he may have abused the all army hotkey. That's a lot of rams. Villagers are coming in. Do they have the textile upgrade? Yes, they have the bonus health. He's using them to torch down the rams. One ram down already. They just need a single salvo to bring it to its knees. And a second salvo to finish it off. And they're going back. Men at arms and Landsknecht are going ham on the Chuganu and on the crossbows. And you can see that splash damage from the uh, Landsknecht coming in when they get a hit. But Viper smartly focused down every single Landsknecht and now only has to deal, only, with elite men at arms, which have seven ranged armor, which means they're taking 14 plus nine is 23. They're taking 16 damage from crossbows with 180 health. They need 15 crossbow hits just to get taken down. There isn't even that many anymore. So overall, it costs a lot of micro for Viper right now to, uh, to clear this up. It looks like a, a relic was dropped here. Maybe there was a prelate trying to backstab with some kind of conversion. He's now trying to pick up the relics, put them in the Reknitz again. There we go. He gets one inside, gets a second inside. And the third one is there as well. Needs a bit of tedious micro, but he's done it. Economy restored. Landsknechte and men at arms have bought the time. It is clear that the Viper tried to go for a timing attack to punish Imperial when he saw how frightfully fast it was. He put everything in that ram attack. But the Muslim is bouncing back. He was able to use many villagers. It's something he does very well, using villagers plentifully to deal with attacks. Just like how he won the uh, tournament recently. Was it the Winter Series? Question mark. The one that the Muslim won, surprisingly, out of nowhere. Uh, out of nowhere. He was very good on ladder already, but people didn't peg him as a top 10 favorite. And in the final game against Vortex, he managed to win... Uh, with a 4-3 score, he also pulled many villagers against Vortex's Abbasi Dynasty Manganel attack. The Steel Series tournament, yes, that's it. And he holds! He holds, so what did he do well? Very early farming. Didn't drop too low on wood. He inspired his wood villagers. Fast castle, but not too fast, knowing that he has a bit more time against Chinese. Spear defense of the Deer Scouts. A very fast Imperial. One early barracks for upgrades. And then lots of ranged armor by good scouting. The Viper against Muslim. GG.